as France prepared for the 1915 International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts. Sadly, that expo had to be postponed for 10 years due to World War I. In 1925, the expo was finally on and there were strict rules. Anything imitating past styles was expressly forbidden. Works were judged for originality and new inspiration and nothing could be based on the last generation of anything. Designs had to be modern and cutting edge and futurism was the hallmark of the expo. The International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts gave birth to what we now, called art, what we now call Art Deco. And while it made its debut in 1925 in Paris, the term Art Deco did not become an official label until 1966. It was the Roaring Twenties, a joyful time between wars when great strides were made into the machine age and a new modern aesthetic was embraced. It was the Jazz Age, a time of the rockette, along with the bootlegger and the gangster and the flapper. You can almost hear the Charleston playing in the background. Soon, everything from jewelry, furniture, and the most mundane of household items were being designed with these same sleek modern lines. Art Deco was a reflection of the times. In the 20s and 30s, American culture fell in love with the idea of speed and transportation. While much of Europe was still in chaos at the end of the World War in 1918, the United States entered a period of extravagant development. Imposing skyscrapers changed skylines. Beautiful new suspension bridges connected urban landscapes. Streamlined ships appeared as well as trains, planes, automobiles, airports, concrete highways, and service stations, all harbingers of a new modernity in both rural and urban America. Art Deco reflected the fun and frivolity of the times. Sometimes it is baked into the structure of a building, and other times it is layered on other base styles. It was theatrical and purely decorative and not political. And why not? Look at how the economy grew through the 1920s. There had been a good 10 years of great growth, a new spirit, prosperity, and industrialization. They were out of the war. Everything was going great, at least prior to the stock market crash, which you can see in this graph. But even after the crash and during the Depression, this design aesthetic lingered. Popular styles continued, whether paid for by the private sector or the federal government. When the depression set in, the government stimulated the economy through programs like the WPA and employed architects, painters, and sculptors. And the style of the times, much of it Art Deco, continued well through the depression. Art Deco architecture can have the same streamlined forms as the sleek, almost sensual look of automobiles, trains, planes, and ships. The world was opening up in many aspects. Homes had radios and new music and news from around the world filled living rooms and imaginations. News and pictures of the archaeologist's discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922 had sparked imaginations. The world was getting smaller and explorers were reporting on world travels. The design world, soaking it in, used some of these exotic design themes on surfaces and textures for a purely decorative effect. We'll see several examples of Egyptian influence in Art Deco, but this one, comparing the papyrus motif illustrated on an Egyptian scroll on the left with the elevator door design in the Chrysler building is a fine example. Also note the human figures on the scroll on the left, and then look at this. This is a brass screen over the entrance to the Circle Tower, a building in Indianapolis, which reflects the keen interest in Egyptology at the time. This was completed just eight years after King Tut's tomb was discovered. Sculptor Joseph Willenborg filled the bronze grill with hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic like images. Other Egyptian esque elements can be seen in sun rays and zigzags and, and triangles throughout. Mesoamerican and Mayan motifs also appear, echoing a similar surge in exploration and attraction to the exotic. Note the surface treatment here by architect Timothy Pfluger and how the Mayan mask on the left 
is similar to the sculpted wall surface above an entrance to this building in San Francisco. Also note the totems and the pyramidal shaped window opening. That pyramid and the Mayan theme continues and we'll see that throughout buildings and on interior decor throughout the presentation. The machine age had begun in the mid 1800s, but it was in its full glory in the early 1900s and had a huge influence on Art Deco. Inspired by industrialization, building and travel, design elements symbolize the modern world, electricity on the left, and travel for the masses on the right. Take a look at this celebration of the automobile at a Chevy showroom in Chicago. The car is obvious, but look at the terracotta detailing with the stoplights, the hubcaps, and the wheels. Terracotta was a very popular medium in Art Deco because sculpted designs were made into molds from which prolific terracotta pieces could be made and affixed to a building. Terracotta designs could be individually carved as well, making it a very easy uh, medium to use in repeating decorative motifs. Some people confuse Art Nouveau with Art Deco, but the chief difference between them is the influence of Cubism, which gives Art Deco a more fragmented geometric character as seen in this image of the Niagara Mohawk Tower in Syracuse, New York. This gleaming metal figure known as the spirit of energy, who protecting the main entrance to the headquarters of this power company, symbolizes the optimistic future that public electricity can provide while reinforcing a strong corporate identity. So now we've seen how popular culture, advertising, exotic Egyptian and Mayan cultures and cubism have influenced Art Deco, but local history and culture also play a role. We'll also see designs inspired by local and regional flora and fauna, such as those at the Nebraska and Louisiana state capitals, with the corn and anvil representing agriculture and industry, and Louisiana state flower and bird, the pelican and magnolia on the right. Native American themes are numerous and have been used to symbolize strength and record history, especially in government buildings. But as you might imagine, as we've learned since our elementary school days, that depiction is often romanticized as peaceful, which was not always a ca the case, especially in the West. So let's take a tour, keeping these things in mind. We're gonna go from East to West and visit nine Art Deco buildings. You'll notice that most of them were built in the early thirties, a few years after our theme year of the 1920s, but being an economic development myself, I understand that building projects take years from conception through design and completion. So while completion dates may have been in the, in the 30s, ideas and design, design themes are very likely products of the Roaring Twenties. Here we are in the middle of dynamic modern New York City at the Chrysler Building, one of the quintessential samples of Art Deco architecture in the world. This building is essentially an homage to one rich man. It was built as the headquarters of Chrysler Corporation in 1929 and designed to serve as a billboard for Chrysler on the New York skyline. When Walter Chrysler hired architect William Van Allen to build a new building for his headquarters, he wanted the tallest building in the world. It was a time of great economic prosperity and of intense real estate development in New York City. Van Allen was in a neck and neck competition with his ex-partner turned rival H. Craig Severance, who was also working downtown at the same time on another would-be tallest building in the world, 40 Wall Street. The two rivals closely watched each other's progress and Severance, after discovering the final proposed height of the Chrysler building, added two feet to 40 Wall Street and declared victory. However, Van Allen was secretly assembling a 185 foot spire inside of the building and to everyone's surprise, the glorious spire appeared on top of the Chrysler building seemingly, seemingly out of nowhere on October 23rd, one day before the Wall Street crash of 1929. And for a time, the Art Deco building, the Art Deco Chrysler building was the tallest in the world. The Chrysler held on to that title for 11 months, only to be dwarfed by the Empire State Building. 
but nevertheless, it still holds the honor of being the first ever building to rise over a thousand feet and remains the tallest brick building in the world. And look at those bricks with their distinctive chevrons and horizontal black and white stripes. Notice the decor of the hubcaps on the right up there. The hubcaps, the fenders, and the spokes of a wheel in the brickwork, and the winged Chrysler radiator caps at the building on the step backs at the 31st floor. There are also eight streamlined, beautiful copies of the 1929 Chrysler Eagle hood ornaments on the 61st floor. And this is another amazing view of the spire taken by Margaret Bork White, whom we learned about last month. This is the Lexington Avenue entrance on the left with its quintessential art deco zigzags and triangles and gleaming surfaces. The triangle mo motif is prevalent over the entire building, including these elevator doors echoing the form on the arches on the tower. The lobby itself is a triangle form lavishly decorated with red Moroccan marble walls, sienna colored floor, onyx, blue marble, and steel. Artist Edward Trumbull was hired to paint murals on the ceiling, a 110 by 67 foot mural named Transport and Human Endeavor, commissioned in 1930. The mural's theme is energy and man's application of it to the solution of his problems. It looks like one grand solution to me. And in the same place on the right, the elevator doors we saw earlier with the Egyptian papyrus motif. And welcome to the top floor where the Cloud Club welcomed Chrysler and Texaco company executives in a lofty spot for entertaining and deal making. Notice the decor on the right with the sun rays that go up the walls, the planets, chandeliers, and the stars on the ceiling. This is an older photograph and is black and white, but it's and a little tough to see at times, but these are the sun rays going up the walls here, the planet chandeliers and the stars. And here you have the uh, sun reflected through one of the triangle shaped windows on the top of the tower. The next building on our tour is the RCA Victor and General Electric building just down Lexington Avenue from the Chrysler, as you can see from this photograph. It was completed in 1931 by architect Walter Cross with the incredible and the incredible detail in this building was meant to harmonize with the neighboring buildings, one of which is a lovely brick church with a dome and many arches. And before I switch slides, notice the detail in the brickwork, especially over the entry here, the marble around the entry and the steel embellishments. So there are these steel embellishments, all these arches, which reflect uh, and mirror some of the uh, shapes in the church as well. The radiating brick form forming a sun. The original design of the building was, and this is the same building here reaching into the sky. The original design was to showcase RCA Victor's corporate identity, their main product being radio and record player combinations. But while the building was under construction, RCA split from its parent company, General Electric and moved to Rockefeller Center. As part of the deal, GE got the building. And luckily the radio waves designed for RCA worked well as symbols of electricity for GE's identity too. From this view, you can see how the building fits with its neighbor, the church in the foreground with a complementary brick color and, and even the shape of the church dome is echoed in the tower in the corporate tower many stories above. Here you begin to see the terracotta detail on the, on the building. Um, notice here the exterior details with the rounded corners of the building, the rounded windows in the building. And they're all part of the effort to harmonize the building within its neighborhood. Look at the spirit figurehead at the top of the rounded corner on the right, seemingly the source of a radio wave below it. And note the storefront tympanum shapes, those triangular shapes in that uh, zigzag over the store windows in the photo on the, the storefront windows on the photo on the left. 
There's that stepped pyramid motif again. Here you see more terracotta deity figures layered onto the building surface, creating that ubiquitous art deco zigzags in the fold of their robes. But let's go inside. To get your bearings here, the bottom of this photo shows the top of a brass revolving door. So you are looking above the door through a brass grill with a repeating radio wave pattern and glorious colors of glass, suns and sun rays on the walls and ceilings, everything gleaming with, with pride for the luxury that radio and electricity bring to our lives. It's so over the top, it could be a cathedral if we didn't know it was a corporate office. Here we are <clears throat> in the elevator lobby of the same building with the notable suns in the triangle shapes created by the vaulted ceiling from which hang these spectacular chandeliers. And I wish the chandeliers showed up better in this photo, they're overexposed and I couldn't find one that was better, but um, that, uh, typical art deco angle, triangle, and uh, repeating oh, repeating design, sorry about that, uh, is seen here. <clears throat> and the crowning glory, uh, the tower. A central pier on each of four sides of the tower rises to support one of four figures in the building's crown. Each of the 50-foot tall figures depicts a deity holding forked lightning. The building's crown contains Gothic tracery embellished with gold. The tracery is intended to represent electricity and radio waves, and the rays emanating from the deities are lit up at night. I think this is just amazing. Look at all the terracotta details along in here. This is the tracery we're talking about. These are the rays. It reminds you a little of you, the University of Iowa Hospitals Tower, uh, but many more details on it. And just look at the details of the radio waves, electric waves uh, shooting off into the air in their kind of triangle zigzaggy way. And this, this is a view, although not the best view at night of how it is lit up. Okay, well, on to the other side of the state and our first look at a government building. Corporate identity was not the purpose of this building. So instead of braggadocious and, corp and decorative features that sell you on buying a car or electric utilities, the Art Deco in this building celebrates the history and the city of Buffalo's place in it. Architectural historian Rainer Banham calls this astonishing Art Deco bulk. The pyramidal shaped building was designed by architect John Wade, who referred to it simply as American-esque 1927. And remember, the term Art Deco wasn't used until the 60s, so that makes all kinds of sense. The entrance, the entrance consists of a colonnade and a frieze, which you see there. The columns themselves represent bundled reeds illustrating strength from unity. Planning and design for this 32-story building had started in 1920, and it took two years to build before it was completed, not until 1931, for a total cost of $7 million, which just blows me away as I uh, go through these, you know, $50, $60 million projects that are locally and, and quite a bit smaller. This building was ahead of its time in many ways, as it was designed and built with a geothermal cooling system. They took advantage of strong winds coming off Lake Erie by putting huge vents in the west side of the building, which caught the wind, which then traveled down ducts to below the basement, where the air, air was cooled by the ground and then forced back through vents throughout the building. This slide shows the development of the terracotta and frieze sculpture work by sculptor Rene Chamberlain. Themes included the natural environment, the Iroquois Indian nation, and the United States relations with Canada. And I just love especially those animal ones on the left where the animal form breaks through the border around the outside. It's just a beautiful detail. <clears throat> 
Important to the city of Buffalo was the development of the Erie Canal and the pioneering and industrial spirit of Buffalo citizens past and present. This image is at the far left of the fabulous frieze over the front colonnade, but I wanted you to see it up close and personal. It really highlights the machine age aspect of Art Deco themes um, with the uh, workings of the Erie Canal going on there, the pulling of a lever, the um, people carrying their tools and lanterns and, and uh, working very hard. So this is at the far left of the frieze I'm going to show you next. The top photo here, there's those uh, guys working there. Um, but the figures on the friezes, as I just mentioned, are not wizened Greeks or Roman orators, but they're early Buffalonians. They're dock workers, riveters, truckers, aviators. And a central figure in the frieze, though, is the symbol of Buffalo and a woman. And there she records history as it unfolds around her. And that is happening in, I believe that is happening right here. The other four images below, I wanted to put up because they're so beautifully designed and, and um, indicate some of the agricultural industry that was going on in and around, uh, in and around Buffalo. There's a lot to see on the inside, but my very favorite aspect of the interior is this incredible stained glass sunburst in the council chambers. I just couldn't imagine giving a presentation in, in front or under, it ends up, a stained glass like this. It's that sun again, the symbol of power, growth, health, passion, and the cycle of life in many cultures and religions. And here it is in context. The space in the city council chambers is ringed by 12 pillars, the crowns of which depict virtues expected of the chamber's inhabitants. The symbols were originally to have been busts of prominent Buffalonians, but the council could never agree on who exactly should be represented. So the architect finally interceded and declared that virtues be put up there uh, and substituted for the bust. And interestingly, people noted later, the absence of the virtues for honesty, efficiency, and thrift on those pillars in the city council chamber. Read into that what you may. And I've only touched on the windows and the pillars, but notice all of that surface decoration and triangles and zigzags and grilled patterns. Turning to the south now, <clears throat> we are at, oops, this, sorry, the tower. <laughs> um, on, on the tower here at the top of the building, this is the Buffalo uh, City Hall, are three-dimensional chevrons of polychrome terracotta. Below that is a band of terracotta with an American Indian motif. The band is interrupted at the corners by these highly stylized stone eagles. And again, more triangles, more zigzags, and more pyramid shapes. I think that polychrome terracotta is just stunning. Now turning south, uh, here we are at the Louisiana State Capitol, a 34 story skyscraper and the tallest state capital in the United States. This is an example of greatly simplified classicism with art deco details layered on. Only two other state capitals have been built with this design. Huey Long, then governor and later state senator, er, and later senator wanted a tower, so the architects used the Nebraska state capital design, which was under construction at the time as a model. The building design took only 36 days. The design took only 36 days and construction only took 14 months. And Huey Long, whose dream this building was, was assassinated here in the building for which he fought so hard in September of 1935. And you can still see bullet holes on the wall, on the marble walls inside. So in the left image here, you'll see the pelican and magnolia motif representing Louisiana's flora and fauna. That's the state bird and state flower. This band of uh, uh, the motif is found at the base of this statue running all the way around it. And the statue then uh, 
is a depiction of history, including Native Americans who established the, uh, or sorry, who originally inhabited the reason, the region, the French and Spanish colonists who explored the area in the 17th and 18th centuries, and the Americans who made their home here in the state's earliest days. The sculptor here is Ulrich Ellerhusen. The tower of the building is also decorated with important groups of sculpture representing the history of the state. There are four winged figures here. This is one of the corners. And I don't know if our little um, grid of pictures is covering up your side, uh, the right side of this, it is mine. Uh, but the four winged figures represent law, science, philosophy and art. They're carved into the corners of the tower and they reach from the 22nd to the 25th floor. So we're quite a ways up there. Then there are four stone eagles which act as flying buttresses. They're up here on the corners. Oh, let me go back there a sec. Um, the four stone eagles at the top. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. And um, this lantern at the top, which is a 23 foot tall lantern symbolizing the higher aspirations of Louisiana. Okay, so I want you to notice the eagle. I pointed it out before, here he is. And also the pelicans. The pelicans march right around the building at this level and they're interspersed with trees. I think one of the trees is a cypress tree and I'm not sure what the other is. Um, not sure it matters a whole lot, but it, the building is just covered up here with, um, with this artwork. Okay, so keeping in mind the pelicans and the eagles, look at this amazing view. Um, these are the pelicans on the left, and I found this photo um, in researching the, the building. What they're doing here is checking for um, the effects of acid rain and to make sure that the pelicans are um, in, in good shape and, and not going to fall down and onto, the, uh, onto the public below. Um, and same with the eagle over here on the right. Again, I don't know if your view is obscured. Mine is a little bit, but uh, I thought it was kind of fun because you can, you can you know, see these from the ground, but you don't get to see the intricacy and really the stylized nature of these until you're uh, so up close and personal. All right. Inside uh, the Louisiana State Capitol is Memorial Hall. Memorial Hall. It's 124 feet long and 40 feet wide, and it's filled with artwork, sculpture, chandeliers, and more than a few hints at um, the myriad flora and fauna of the state. And there are two very striking Art Deco murals on either end depicting Louisiana as a land of plenty. The mural on the east end uh, in this side is named the goddess of knowledge and time. The art deco style vases here you can see small and on this side much larger were a gift from France. Elevator doors here have carved individuals or uh, sculpted individuals who uh, held prominent positions uh, in the state's history. And look at the amazing chandelier here and the decor along the border of the Memorial Hall. It's just stunning. And no photo seems to do it justice. Well, let's head on to Oklahoma. In the late 20s, a lot of new wealth had been created in the oil fields of Oklahoma, and there was a surprising amount of new building uh, downtown in, in Tulsa, and much of it was Art Deco. The oil, the oil tycoons were just as interested in promoting their brands with tall buildings as the automobile millionaires, but I like this one and wanted to share that because it was a little different than everything we've seen so far. This is the Tulsa Fire Alarm Building built in 1931. It's built on the outskirts of Tulsa where even here, corporate identity is important. This is the Tulsa Fire Alarm Company's central office. Clearly, the building doesn't have to be a skyscraper or a monument to evoke strength and have an almost government-like presence. The building was designed by Frederick Kirshner and inspired by the Mayan temple design. 
It has a substantial terracotta frieze all the way around it with several fire-related elements. A recurring theme on the front facade is a double-headed dragon, which is actually here. And I'll move a little closer up so you can see it here. The large frieze over the front door has a male figure holding in his hands the product of this corporate identity. Excuse me, it's called a Gamewell, it's called Gamewell Alarm Tape. And somehow this alarm tape connected buildings in downtown Tulsa with this fire alarm station here and the calls could be handled and dispatched from, from there. Um, <clears throat> the, so you see the this figure in the center holding this um, holding the product of the company. Then you see the fire hoses, the firemen, um, and then the fire breathing dragons here just over the door. It's quite spectacular. Another couple close ups of dragons and fire hoses and these symbols of strength. Notice the, um, the masks here kind of take on the, the Mayan mask look that we saw earlier in, in the uh, program as well. Still in Tulsa, I thought you would like to see the Tulsa State Fairgrounds, which were built in 1933. This evening picture gives an overview of the Expo building and a hint of the terracotta frieze along the top edge here. This is probably the prettiest photo, but it doesn't give you a really good sense of uh, how beautiful that that multicolored terracotta is. The daytime picture helps a little with a little bit with that, but to pull it all close in here, um, you see how this Art Deco celebrates the people and their agricultural way of life in this highly decorative and beautifully made frieze. You've got repeating floral patterns. I don't know if these are um, the ribbons from the state fair, but you've got the livestock and just this beautiful interpretation of uh, life in, in Oklahoma. Substantially different from the Chrysler building, isn't it? But still Art Deco. So admittedly, Moving along now to Nebraska. Admittedly, our family has always joked about this building, and maybe you have too, as being the Phallus Palace or the Penis on the Prairie, because we only really ever saw it from Interstate 80, and it rose so far above everything else. But of all the buildings that I researched, I think this might be my favorite. New York architect Bertram Grosvenor Goodhue won a design competition in 1920 and designed this, the nation's first state house that was the first major depart departure from the prototypical form of the nation's capital to use um, for a state capital. And it also included an office tower. It was built in four phases over 10 years from 1922 to 1932 at a cost of just under $10 million. And from the center of an office square building, uh, of a square office building, I should say, with four square courtyards rises this 400 foot domed tower crowned with a 19 foot tall bronze figure of the sower, so sowing the seeds. And you'll notice around the top of that tower as well, you'll see some of the native American motifs in uh, mosaic up along the edge. You would never see that from uh, below. So it's kind of special to be able to look close, uh, close at it. On either side of a grand staircase leading up to the main entrance are wing walls like this carved with bison and corn sacred to, the Nebra sacred to Nebraska's first people. And inscribed upon the bison panels are the names of tribes with ties to Nebraska and poems and prayers from those groups. And again, I wish this photo did it justice, but um, there's this beautiful uh, typography happening just faintly over um, the image of the bison here. And the typography again contains the um, relevant tribes to the area and, and poems as well. 
Um, there are so many inscriptions on the building that are just uh, really beautiful as well. They had actually hired a director of inscriptions for this building because there are so many. <clears throat> The north facade of the Capitol, the main entrance, identifies the building as a seat of government without ever really saying Nebraska State Capitol. On top of the entrance pylons are separate relief carvings of the United States shield and a proposed Nebraska State shield seal and the four large figures of wisdom, justice, power, and mercy. Wisdom, justice, power, and mercy. You can see this carved above here who are constant guardians of the law. And just over the door, the relief of a scene of pioneers with their covered wagons and livestock and the motto, the salvation of states is watchfulness in the citizen. And could that ever not be so relevant? Inside then at the Rotunda Center, there are four mosaics representing the genius of water, fire, air, and earth. And they surround a larger mosaic of earth as life giver. A mosaic band or guillotine interlaces the five round mosaics showing the fossil life of the Great Plains. And Hildreth Meyer was the tile and mosaic designer. But here, here are the, this is the guillotine, I think is how you pronounce it with the uh, fossils and, um, uh, well, actually with the fossils that encircle all of the uh, round motifs in the tile mosaic floor. Just stunning. At the threshold of the foyer is another panel depicting the genius of creative energy and Meyer's first full-blown architect, uh, or sorry, art deco design at the Capitol. And I just love this one as well. The project art director specified that she was to depict the genius of creative energy with lightnings ruling the four elements. So in his right hand, the genius brandishes a lightning bolt, grasping the reins of a powerful unseen force with his left hand, he is propelled across the lightning charged sky. I love it. And look at these beautifully carved uh, doors, a symbolic tribute to Native Americans. These chamber doors feature stalks of corn in the center with a, thumber, a thunderbird representing rain and life on top. On the right is an Indian standing on an otter representing medicine. And on the left is a woman above a turtle symbolizing fertility. And the total weight of these doors is 1,500 pounds. And from Nebraska to New Mexico, we go. And now for something completely different, Pueblo Deco, as it is affectionately known. This is the Chemo Theater in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which was built in 1927. And it obviously looks very di different than anything that we've seen to date. Interestingly, it was conceived by Italian immigrant, Oreste Bacecchi, a successful entrepreneur in the entertainment industry as an homage to the Pueblos and other Native Americans. Bacecchi instructed architects to travel around New Mexico and immerse themselves, immerse themselves in cultures and architectural styles of the Southwest. Buffalo skulls refer to uh, the Buffalo dance performed at Taos and Pueblo every January. And you can see the medallions in terracotta applied to the outside of the building uh, with uh, images of uh, Native Americans, but there's also a hint of that Mayan, uh, those Mayan themes in there too, with the stepped pyramids and, uh, and, and other aspects as well. And then this is the interior of the theater way, uh, very, very decorated. And you can see the kachinas on the left and the right, if it's not obscured by uh, the little boxes that show our names. Um, but also look at the detail and the zigzags um, repeated in rows down the ceiling uh, of this. <clears throat> and finally, we'll go to two on the West Coast. This too, like so many others we've seen, is a celebration of the region. In this case, it's the marine industry in Vancouver, 
British Columbia. Now this building or this photograph is from 1940. So it doesn't show how it's been built up around um, since, but <clears throat> uh, an entrepreneur from Toronto realized the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914 would greatly increase Vancouver's importance as a commercial port. And he decided that the city needed an iconic building like the new Chrysler building in New York. Construction started in March of 1929 and was completed in a year. And the architects envisioned a, quote, great crag rising from the sea, clinging with sea flora and fauna, tinted in sea green, touched with gold. So these are some of their terracotta friezes. Aren't they just delightful? I love these. Um, they're wonderful terracotta highlighting marine life, including this frieze of fish and seahorses underwater. There's friezes of Neptune over here on the left, surrounded by sea foam, supporting his or sporting his trident and crown. There's Canada geese over here, uh, salmon jumping over here, and there's that tinged with blue for the water. Uh, in the marine life there. Amazing decor over, the, uh, over these parts of the building. I especially love this detail in the door. Um, this is just over some glorious brass doors that I'll show you next, but this is a, this is a very Egyptian looking osprey with a fish in its talons and roiling waters below. Love those details. And these are the doors. So the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Osprey I showed you is right about here above the red doors below on either side, but they're just a very minor part of this amazing entryway uh, here. <clears throat> um, there's uh, amazingly intricately carved seaweed, turtles, crabs, and seahorses in this section of, of the main entrance. Uh, and in front of a stained glass, then, in, in front of a stained glass, there is a bronze sculpture of Captain Vancouver's ship, whoever Captain Vancouver was, in front of a huge sun in the background. Look at the sun rays emanating from um, the sun there just behind the ship. I mean, it's incredible. Um, these doors will open into uh, a lobby where the wall sconces take on this sort of similar shape as the, as the uh, ship here with the roiling waters right below it. Um, so we go from this entrance inside to this. Believe it or not, they were intending on doing a much more elaborate lobby, if you can even imagine. Um, see, from this end, you see the, the sun at the far end, that's the doors are the stained glass, and then you can see the rays of the sunshine behind that, um, at the center of which is the uh, ship coming out. But interior wise here, here we have uh, these themes very reminiscent of the, of the Mayan temple designs. And these are the light sconces, which are the bows of ships coming out of the walls. It's just incredible. And then you can't really see it well from this view, but the elevator uh, doors down here have this really heavy brickwork, um, again, reminiscent of the, of the Mayan temple type of design. Okay, on to our last one on the West Coast. Um, the Paramount Theater in Oakland, California is our last stop before we head home to Iowa City. The theater opened in December of 1931 and was an Art Deco testament to the burgeoning movie industry. On the front of the facade <clears throat> is a 100 foot tall mosaic with 70, sorry, 70 different colors of tile. The two largest figures, one here on the left and one there, one male, one female, represent the guiding part of the theatrical and motion picture industry. And each holds puppet strings, easier to see maybe on the, the view on the right. Each holds puppet strings 
leading to four tiers of puppets. And you can see the four tiers of puppets a little better on, on the slide at the left here. So not unlike buildings in New York City that advertise Chrysler or the power industry, this too is a kind of advertisement, but this one heralds the movie industry. And the inside is amazing. Oh. It's just incredible. Um, this is inside the lobby. And on the lower left here, just kind of behind the staircase um, is black marble alternating with chrome bands on top of which are gilded plaster dancers in front of uh, columns of light. And these dancers are in that sort of almost two dimensional form that the Egyptian uh, human forms we've seen are as well. And notice these golden columns of light and the green metal decoration and the ceilings above. Um, note that this, uh, the, the column of light here is, is going to be represented as light coming through trees. So these red columns would be redwood tree trunks um, with light coming between them, just dappled light. And then this would be a tree canopy up here. It's a special form of metal fin uh, technology developed by the architect for this particular theater. Okay, so now pretend you walk up the stairs and you're standing at the top of those stairs looking back the other way. You get another feel for the um, fins, these fins that represent the tree canopy here, but you really get a feel for the redwood forest with these terracotta columns and the columns of light uh, between them. And again, you can see these dancing figures here. And then on the far right is the um, uh, ooh, Fountain of Light uh, sculpture here, which is right over the lobby doors. But you see the re repeating motifs that we've seen before in uh, triangles and, and uh, zigzags and um, all kinds of art deco. This is one more view. You can't get one view that really shows it all, but this is looking back towards the, the lobby with the fountain of light sculpture right in the center. Um, this picture shows best the metal fin technology that was used uh, on the ceilings in these buildings. It was built and, or I mean, it was designed and patented by the architect for the building. And the way it worked was lights behind this series of metal fins were bounced off um, a regular drywall ceiling above so that soft light bounced back through these metal fins, creating this really unique um, lighting source without a real source that was evident to it. And this is, a, this is a look at the walls. Again, a little bit tough to see, but um, these are all cast plaster sections um, in this amazing pattern of design, floral. It has everything in it from, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Greek and Romanesque and just themes from everywhere um, on this building. And probably rightly so, since it was a building of theater. Uh, but I wanted to show you the close up before I showed you the, the full view here. This is the theater looking back from the stage, looking out at the audience from the stage. And this is the theater ceiling again with that silver fin technology. It's uh, just a series of fins on the ceiling through which light is bounced. And then the entire wall system is covered in uh, in this plas cast plaster uh, design. It's, it's just incredible. So here's where we went, the little pink diamonds. These, these were areas where some sort of quintessential Art Deco examples were that I wanted to show you and, and how their inf locations influenced um, the embellishments. But how about just one more stop? Let's go from the ridiculous in that theater to let's call it the sublime in Iowa City and see what Art Deco had to offer here. We're almost done, but I couldn't do this without sharing a few things. 
This is the Varsity Theater that was built a little bit after 1930, after one prior had burned to the ground. But here you can see the vertical um, architectural elements here and the banding within creating what I like to call kind of a footlight motif to it. And the quintessential press citizen building, I think we could probably all pull that one out of our uh, thoughts as as probably being art deco. It's actually the building is actually built in a in a modern style, but the the frieze we look at is um, is over the front entry is definitely uh, art deco. There are very few buildings built in Iowa City in the Depression, but the press citizen was one of them, and it was 1937. And not unlike that fire alarm company in Tulsa, newspaper companies also designed their buildings to suggest that they were really an element of government or at least equal to it. So the style of this building reflects that with its wide steps leading up to the entrance, um, the raised center pavilion with its brick sections on either side containing narrow panels or relatively narrow panels of glass block and all the windows to the side and the rear in glass block were a popular feature in modern and art deco. And a quick close up here, doesn't this look like many of the images we've seen earlier with the um, uh, machine age shown and all the sleek modes of transportation uh, here. This one is actually depicting all the ways that um, news has been uh, carried from days of the town crier through the Pony Express through airplanes and carrier pigeons. Um, so there's that and then on either side uh, there's a terracotta piece representing uh, agriculture and on the other side there's one for science and industry. This is a building um, that sits now where the uh, parking ramp on Burlington and Dubuque Street sits. Um, it's not a, a, you know, overtly example of Art Deco, as I don't think really any of our Iowa City ones are, but I think we were, um, you know, subtly picking up on what was popular around the country in, in some of these buildings. So some of the patterning around the corner and the decor on this building reflects that, and certainly the uh, lettering on the building above. This building you may recognize. Um, this one is uh, the Savings and Loan Building on the corner of Clinton and College. It was originally built in 1877, but it was uh, purchased and remodeled completely into this modern uh, design in about 1940 or so. And probably most classically, um, Art Deco would be this Art Deco would be this door here with um, sort of nine bands of stone cut to this. Uh, entry of a, a steel framed uh, uh, door, brushed steel door, and um, the very Art Deco lettering over the top with savings and loan building um, in it. But again, you have the repeated uh, and very popular for the time glass block there. We all know this relatively nondescript building in, on Dubuque Street in Iowa City, the Deadwood. Well, I never knew why it looked like that. Who would ever have done something that looked um, quite so uh, unconnected, I guess. Um, but it was a style of the times. And, uh, and, it, and it looks that way here. here. Here it is in 1940, just after it was remodeled. And it was remodeled on a, an 1880s uh, brick building as well. Uh, but note the clean lines, the glass block of the modern style. And this was a furniture shop in the, in the time. So this area here is a showcase window. And I believe it's probably surrounded by a black Carrara glass, which was very popular in a number of buildings in downtown Iowa City, um, including the soap opera, which wasn't the soap opera when this was done. Um, but in the late 1930s, this area, um, this entrance to the building on the Ped Mall was redone to accommodate a little uh, insurance office in the curved glass section here. And J. Bradley Rust, a, a very well-known Iowa City architect was behind the design there. So 
we'll see in a couple more examples after this, and then we'll be done. Um, the black shiny Carrara glass, curved glass going into the store, horizontal banding on the black, and um, this just very kind of tight design. This one as well, think about Mickey's next to Prairie Lights, and you have this, the Smith's Cafe. This was distinctly Art Deco as well, and it was also designed by the same J. Bradley Rust. And again, he uses that black Carrara glass, curved corners around a round window, and that beautiful Art Deco font. And that circular window remained a uh, downtown landmark for many years. And last but not least, certainly, the storefront uh, remodel of the same period, perhaps in the early 1940s, of Hans Jewelers, one we all know well, um, from um, one of the longest family-owned businesses in Iowa City, probably in Iowa at all, uh, and owned by our own Betsy Boyd's husband, uh, Bill Nusser, as well. This remodel was done, like I said, in the 40s or so. This one was of a burgundy colored Carrara glass. You can maybe pick it up a little bit um, here where the light reflects off it. Uh, but again, the beautiful curved glass, the terrazzo floor, the etched glass, the brushed steel door, and the beautiful Art Deco uh, font that we have here. So we've seen examples of corporate puffery of state pride and American history and celebrations of a way of life, all reflecting the life and times in America in the 20s and 30s. Jared Goss said it was broad ranging and often contradictory and Art Deco has become known as an umbrella label for a vast range of design and architecture created globally between the first and second wars. Alistair Duncan, another highly regarded authority says of Art Deco, like the associate Supreme Court justice who, when asked for his definition of pornography said, I don't know, but I know it when I see it. And so it is for devotees of Art Deco. Yeah. She did a beautiful job. Oh, 